All right, so I'm gonna to talk to you guys right now about the cardiac cycle and um, the phases of the cardiac cycle we're gonna look at are the early, mid, and late diastolic periods and the early and late systolic periods. Well, while we're talking about this, we're gonna pay special attention to what's going on with the valve and the valve positions, as well as how that relates to the heart sounds, first and second heart sounds. And then we're also gonna talk about um, the speed of the ventricular filling or emptying that's happening in each of these phases. So this is sort of a summary of the cardiac cycle. You can kind of start talking about it in any portion of the cycle. Um, but you see the systolic period, the diastolic period, and then below you see the heart sounds and um, what's going on with the valves. So we're gonna kind of put all of this together. So diast diastole means um, loosely relaxation, systole is contraction. So when the ventricles are in their diastolic period, they're relaxing. When the ventricles are in their systolic period, they're contracting. So we have four chambers. So the atria are going to be ha have both a diastolic and a systolic period, and the ventricles are going to have both a diastolic and a systolic period. Okay. Um, and just quickly, while we're looking at the picture, you see with both the heart sounds, the first heart sound they refer to as the lub sound, the second heart sound they refer to as the dub sound. The sound, the heart sounds are created by the closure of the valves. So when the AV valves close, the first heart sound can be detected. When the semilunar valves close, the aortic and the pulmonic, when the semilunar valves close, the heart second heart sound can be detected. So when you're hearing heart sounds, what you're hearing is the closure of the valves. And um, ideally, that's a very crisp and clear sound, which means that the valves closes, close quickly and efficiently and effectively, completely close. All right, so I'm going to start with a mid-diastolic period because that's just where I like to start. So in mid-diastole, both the atria and the ventricles are relaxed. So when, while you're in the mid-diastolic period and both the atria as, and the ventricles are relaxed, the AV valves are open. And one thing that you can kind of just sort of in your mind think about is the AV valves are almost always open. The only time the AV valves are closed is when the ventricles are contracting. So any other time, the AV valves are open. So when the AV valves are open, that allows blood to passively fill the ventricles. Turns out that about 80% of ventricular filling is passive, which means it just sort of drains from the top to the bottom through, the, through those open AV valves. So those are the significant features of the mid-diastolic period. The semilunar valves are the opposite of the AV valves in that they are almost always closed. So when in doubt, the semilunar valves are most likely going to be closed. The only time the semilunar valves are open is when the blood is being ejected from the ventricles. They open quickly quickly due to the pressure change, and they close immediately. All right, so then we go into the late diastolic period. So here is where, when, pardon me, the atria depolarizes. And when the atria depolarizes, it's going to stimulate atrial contraction, which is going to then allow for the blood to, the last bit of blood, you know, 80% of the blood is filled passively into the ventricles, um, but that last bit, you know, 20, 25%, depending, um, needs to get in there. And so that's, this is when that occurs. So when the atria, the, when the atria depolarizes, um, there's a slight hang up of that electrical signal at the AV node. And that slight hang up allows for the atria to contract. And again, when the atria contract, that's going to that's going to set to relay the last roughly 20% of blood into the ventricles. So now the ventricles are full. Now we go into the early systolic period. So what's going to happen here is now the, after that slight hang up of the impulse it, at the AV node, it's going to go be transmitted through the bundle, AV bundle, through the bundle branches and up and around the Purkinje fibers. And as it travels down to the, to the apex of the heart here, it's going to ultimately um, wrap around the outside of the heart and the heart's going to start to contract from the bottom up. It squeezes from the bottom to the top. So um, 
the atria are relaxed and the ventricles are contracting and the, and the ventricles are squeezing from the bottom up. As soon as the ventricles start to contract, the pressure in the ventricles is going to increase and that's going to cause the AV valves to slam shut. And that, of course, is also when you're going to be able to hear that first heart sound, the one that, um, you know, is c characteristically referred to as the lub sound. The semilunar valves are still closed here. Remember, the semilunar valves are almost always closed. So then we move into the period which we refer to as the, uh, as the period of isovolumetric contraction because the AV valves are closed, the semilunar valves are closed, and the ventricles are squeezing. They're in systole. So isovolumetric refers to same volume contraction, which means the, the volume in the, the blood volume in the ventricles isn't changing because it's trapped in there because the AV valve and the, and the semilunar valves are closed. That's the importance of those, clo those valves closing really tightly and crisply. Right? If they're leaking, then some of the blood is going to leak out of the um, ventricles. In, in if the AV valves were, were, were like, let's say the, the mitral valve wasn't closed, which is the most commonly problematic valve, if it's not closed all the way or if there's a little gap in the valve leaflets, then what's going to happen is some of that blood, as the, as the ventricles are squeezing, some of that blood leaks back up into the atria, which causes a whole host of issues. Um, so when we'll talk about some of those issues when we talk about valve disease. So this period of isovolumetric contraction is really important because the heart is squeezing, the blood volume stays the same, and so the pressure in there is going up. And the pressure continues to build until the pressure inside the ventricles is higher than the pressure in the, ventral, in the vessels that are exiting the ventricles, which are the pulmonary trunk and the aorta mostly the aorta, the pulmonary trunk pumping into the lungs does not require a lot of pressure, which is why the, again, the left, the right, pardon me, ventricle is um, so thin. It's not as muscular. It doesn't need to generate as much pressure, but the pressure in the um, systemic arterial system is high, specifically the aorta. So the, the pressure that's, the heart has to generate a huge amount of pressure in there, you know, greater than 100 millimeters of mercury. So the ventricles are continuing to contract until, again, the pressure inside the ventricles is above that in the major arteries. When that happens, the semilunar valve, that those half moon shaped valve leaflets, the semilunar valves open, the blood is ejected, the ventricles empty, and then they immediately um, go back into relaxation. So when, when we have ventricular contraction, all the blood doesn't leave about two thirds of it leaves. And, and, and that number can be different depending on different uh, disease, um, different disease states. <clears throat> Excuse me. So then we go back to early diastole again, which is repolarization of the ventricles. They're relaxing. The um, semilunar valves are closed. The second heart, as soon as you hear the semilunar valve shut, that's the second heart sound. So this is quick, we contract you know, we eject the blood and then we immediately go into early diastole and the semilunar valves shut right away and the AV valves open. So the AV valves are now open and they're going to remain open until the ventricles start to contract again. So this whole thing starts over. The passive filling of the ventricles, there has already been blood returning to the atria while this is happening, right? So the atrial, atria fill first, followed by the ventricle. So that is the cardiac cycle. Um, so you kind of want to be familiar with that, you know, in terms of what's happening in each one, definitely what's going on with the valves open and closed and how that relates to the, um, to the heart sounds. All right. Um, I want to talk about a couple terms for you here. One is cardiac output. One is cardiac index, stroke volume, end diastolic volume, end systolic volume, and ejection fraction. So it's first cardiac output and cardiac index are similar, but not exactly the same. So um, cardiac output is the volume of blood ejected by each ventricle per minute. We've said that a few times throughout our lecture on, in class. Um, on average, the cardiac output is somewhere in the neighborhood of five liters per minute. Cardiac index is a bit more precise of a measurement, and it basically takes your cardiac output, but it divides it by the body surface area. So when you do that, so it's basically taking into consideration the individual, actually. Um, so when you do that, the average v value, the cardiac index, is, is um, somewhere around 2.8 to 3.3 liters per minute per meter squared, right? So we're now taking in surface area into consideration. Okay, so I just wanted to, because sometimes you might see um, either one of those terms, so I wanted to um, 
at least introduce you to the to the concept of the cardiac index. All right, so stroke volume is the volume of blood ejected by each ventricle per beat. So that is equivalent to about two thirds of the blood in the ventricle because not all, as we said when we were talking about cardiac output or part cardiac cycle, not all of the blood is ejected. About two thirds of the blood is ejected. So <clears throat> to kind of to sort of whittle this down a little bit more, the term end diastolic volume refers to the volume of blood that's in the heart, in the ventricle specifically, at the end of the diastolic period. <clears throat> so remember, diastole is the, rela is the relaxation period. So it's basically the volume of blood in the ventricle before contraction. So that's called end diastolic volume. The ejection fraction is the portion of blood that's ejected from the ventricle with each beat. And that's given as a fraction. And then finally, um, we have the end systolic volume, which is the volume that remains in the heart after the beat. So at the end of systole, that volume, which is usually about one third, you know, in diastolic volume um, is the blood that's in the heart before we contract. The end systolic volume is the amount of heart that remains after you contract. And those terms are kind of important because <clears throat> there's certain circumstances like uh, that's the non a very a very a common and non pathological situation where we see an increase in in, in diastolic volume. Pardon me, and that would be just exercise or any kind of like sympathetic stimulation. Um, in systolic volume, when we're when not we're not getting that number significant to us because as a heart becomes weaker, oftentimes it becomes less efficient at ejecting the blood, and so we'll see that in systolic volume increase, meaning more blood is remaining in the heart. And if you can think back to our first lecture when we talked about um, heart failure in sort of a general sense, that was one of the issues. The, bl the blood isn't leaving the heart. It's instead remaining in the heart after a contraction, in the ventricle, I should say, after a contraction. So those, are, those, those terms all sort of relate to one another, and they're all significant to us as we start to move towards this conversation around um, specifically heart failure. So um, I want to finish this video off by talking a little bit more about um, cardiac output and um, stroke volume and the variables that affect cardiac output, some of them. And the, in order to do this, I also want to, to introduce to you your second homework question, which, <clears throat> which is to define stroke volume and discuss variables that can affect it. So I'm going to discuss some specific variables, and that's kind of what I want you to do in your homework as well. That you can take you can take this from different angles, but we're going to take it um, in a specific sort of direction. All right. So again, the cardiac output is the volume of blood ejected by the ventricle per minute. And of course, we would then, in order to calculate that, we would need to know how much volume is ejected per beat, which is stroke volume, and what the rate of the heart is, how many times it beats per minute. So if you were to multiply those numbers together, you'd have cardiac output. So we know that the heart is, does, does spontaneously depolarize, and it works independently of the nervous system, but it's definitely influenced by the nervous system. So the nervous system can, can very definitely increase the rate at which the heart contracts. So if your heart is beating faster, then that would inc consequently increase your cardiac output. If your heart is beating slower, that also would affect your cardiac output, but in this case, it would decrease your cardiac output. So heart rate is one of the ways that we can um, affect cardiac output, and that really re rests heavily on the um, autonomic nervous system. We, if you remember from earlier on in, our, in the first video, we know that the SA node and the AV node have innervation, are innervated, both of them are innervated by both the, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. You have both beta-1 adrenergic receptors and muscarinic cholinergic receptors at both the SA node and the AV node. So both of those locations are definitely influenced by the autonomic nervous system. All right, so the other variable to play around with is stroke volume. And stroke volume is essentially controlled by three variables that I want you to, I want to discuss and I would like you to further expand on. 
first variable is called preload. So preload refers specifically to the stretch of the, the stretch of the heart or more appropriately to the muscle fiber length. This is where Starling's law of the heart comes in. So if you recall from Starling's law of the heart, basically, and I'm gonna have you expand on this a little bit, with Starling's law of the heart, um, as you as the heart itself fill, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? If you were to put in, increase the volume of blood in the heart, which happens, like I said, normally with exercise, the actual heart muscle fibers would lengthen, right? Because the heart is kind of stretching because there's it's a it's you know it's a mus it's a muscular sac, if you will, and if you put increase the volume of blood, that's gonna increase the stretch, right? Increase the muscle fiber length. And when that happens, the actin and myosin, those contractile proteins, actually line up more favorably. There's a limit to this, but when they stretch a little, when it stretches a little, they line up more favorably, and that actually allows for stronger cross-bridge cross formation, which allows for a more forceful contraction. Right, so you the heart squeezes harder, so that this is going to affect is going to affect stroke volume. One because there's something's causing the heart to stretch, so there's more blood in there to begin with, and then it contracts with more force. So that would definitely increase stroke volume. The second um, variable is contractility, which is very similar, except for the, the changes in the force of contraction are not dependent on changes in the fiber length. So there's different physiologic um, setups that can cause that can alter contractility. One would be an increase in calcium available. Another, of course, would be epinephrine or norepinephrine, right? Um, just causing, but um, norepinephrine and epinephrine. Epinephrine's big um, in the in the um, ventricles. The there's also um, beta one receptors, right? Not they're not, it's not they're not just limited to the nodal tissue, but the ventricles also have beta one adrenergic receptors. They don't have muscarinic receptors, but they do have beta one receptors. So that so the um, sympathetic nervous system via either um, you know direct fight or flight with epinephrine being released from the adrenal medulla or um, just norepinephrine being released at the nerve terminals that will cause a stronger contraction. Um, because of the receptors that are there. Acidosis can do it, so and that's kind of a local change. So acidosis and hypoxia, those kind of go hand in hand. Um, if your tissue is de uh, deprived of oxygen, then it also accumulates carbon dioxide because you're not exchanging your gases at that location. So acidosis and hypoxia tend to go hand in hand, and that tends to stimulate a stronger contraction. For a period of time, there's a there's a limit to all of this, all of these compensations. So um, preload and contractility, we can say, are directly related to stroke volume. Meaning, if you increase preload and you increase contractility up to a point, I'll emphasize that you'll see an increase in cardiac output um, or stroke volume, and consequently cardiac output. The third variable is afterload. So afterload is essentially the amount of tension that has to be generated inside the ventricle in order to empty the ventricle. So as we said earlier, in order to eject the blood, the pressure in the ventricle has to be higher than the pressure outside of the ventricle. So because the pressure is highest in the aorta, we, we usually refer to this as the pressure in the left ventricle has to exceed aortic pressure. So the, you have the, there has to be a certain amount of tension that's generated in order to empty the ventricle, right? So if you um, increase arter arterial blood pressure, meaning the pressure on the on the outside of the, for la for lack of a better term, the pressure in the in the aorta increases, that means that the ventricle, left ventricle, has to generate even more tension to push against that pressure. So that would be an increase in afterload. The same thing is if the ventricle gets really big, the more surface area there, the ventricle has to generate more tension in order to empty the ventricle. So both of those factors, an elevated arterial blood pressure or an increase in ventricular size, um, both will increase afterload. And afterload is inversely related to stroke volume, meaning the higher the afterload, 
the lower the stroke volume if you didn't have anything else, any other compensatory me mechanisms to correct for it. So preload and contractility are positively or, or directly related to stroke volume, where afterload is inversely related to stroke volume. So you're going to, in your homework this week on Canvas, um, you're going to address those three variables, preload, contractility. First, you're going to define stroke volume. Then you're going to address how preload, contractility, and afterload would affect stroke volume. And then discuss it with a little bit of detail which, you know, preload, what preload, contractility, and afterload are all about and give some examples of things that would influence those variables. All right, I'm going to show you a couple pictures. The heart on the right over here, this is normal. This, what we're basically, they've cut into it and we're looking at the ventricle walls. So this, look, this is their left side. See how muscular it is? Um, and then this is a grossly enlarged heart. Look at the first, look how weak the, so the walls have become, so we've exceeded what we could, would re refer to as, um, compensation, right? So as we see a heart approaching failure, right, we're doing all these sorts of things to maintain cardiac output, right? So that's what, that's what all those variables are about. We are going to try, the, the body will do its best to maintain cardiac output, and it does an amazing job, right? The cardiovascular system has incredible compensatory mechanisms, all put in place primarily to maintain cardiac output, because we, of course, need we we pump in our essentially our entire blood volume every minute and we deliver oxygen to our tissues remove waste we have to we really need to keep this running efficiently and so there's all sorts of things put in place to keep cardiac output steady in the face of all sorts of pathology but when you reach the breaking point if you are the tipping point then we start to see those compensatory mechanisms fail and that's essentially what heart failure is right the the, the heart failure could be loosely defined as the inability of the heart to meet the metabolic demands of the body. And so in this case, what's happened is the heart has become grossly enlarged, you know, and there's all sorts of things that can get someone to this place. It could be because they are, have um, been put, pushing against very elevated arterial pressure for so long that the heart ultimately can't keep up with it. Right, it gets more muscular, or not, or I should say, the muscle fibers increase, and then it gets more stretch, and it gets, you know, all these things, but it just can't keep up, can't hold it together, essentially, and so then it will fail. So in this case, you can see that that heart on the left is very weak. It's got a that the chamber volume is huge, which requires already a large increase in tension in order to empty, and the muscle wall becomes weak as it overstretches, and so it can't generate that tension. So that's, in a nutshell, what we'll be dealing with when we talk about heart failure. Okay, um, just to finish this out, I want to look at cardiac output as a measure of total peripheral blood flow and quickly talk about some limitations um, of, of the ability to increase cardiac output. So cardiac output can increase about five times safely. So, uh, and and this is that there are at, at what am i trying to say at different ages and different levels of physical um physical um activity i guess different levels of physical prowess of for lack of a better word um you, we can vary this a little bit but as an average we're going to think that it's a resting heart rate of about 180 beats per minute sustained is about as safe as you can go um, on the top end. And uh, the reason why we don't want an elevate, a, a sustained elevated blood pressure is because it decreases the filling time. You've all seen this in physiology. We do, if you did took physiology at Golden West, you do an experiment around this, right? And if you increase heart rate, what that ultimately, what the period that gets significantly short, shortened is the diastolic period. And so the ventricular filling time gets diminished and you don't get as much blood in, in there. And so you're squeezing, but you're not filling. So you're not really pumping that much. And the other thing that's not happening when you're not relaxed, when the heart doesn't spend a very much time in diastole, the ventricles don't spend a lot of time in diastole, then you also decrease coronary blood flow because as we know, coronary blood flow is phasic, meaning it 
fills when the heart is in diastole. It fills when that AV, um, the semilunar, part of me, valve shuts. So you're putting this huge demand on the heart, and then you're not giving it any isn't the oxygen it needs in order to meet that demand. So 180 beats per minute is considered the maximum safe heart rate. And again, I'm, we're talking about like resting, not like when you're running or you know doing some exertion, that kind of a thing. It will go up, but then it comes back down again. Um, stroke volume, the thing, that, the thing that happens when we increase our ventricular size or we do all those compensations that we talked about, increase contractility, increase ventricular size, um, that means it increases the work, the work on the heart. The heart has to work harder. And so that's really what this all kind of comes down to. All right, um, I'm going to stop this one here and I'm going to pick it up with uh, diagnostic procedures.